it was one of those drugs that everybody thought, I mean, again, when a new drug comes out, there's always excitement, people thinking, oh, this is very promising, and this is great. Um, and again, it was with one of those drugs, but then when some of the studies were done, again, there were a lot of problems with the studies. They didn't really see that much of an effect, and people that were using it, you were able to get it through the underground. And usually, if, if there is an effect, you're gonna, even if it's just demonstrated to be nothing in a clinical study, if it's getting used in the community, and if it's effective, word will get out that it's effective, and people will, I mean, the buyer's clubs will just get inundated with a lot, so of, with not, a lot of the things, and it never happened. Um, no, it's, it's not approved. And, and the studies that were done just stopped, and people and the company in France, I believe, that was making it doesn't produce it anymore. Hmm. Now, about this drug on underground network, mm -hmm. uh, exactly, you know, what is it, and how has the uh, FDA changed its approach to it? Mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's a real big change happened this year when DDC. Before DDC was approved, peop, um, well, basically a little history of the, of the buyers clubs. And they're, they're, all, they're all called different things. Some, most of them are just referred to generally as buyers clubs. Um, the one in New York is PWA Health Group. There's some in Fort Lauderdale. There used to be one in Los Angeles, and once DDC was approved, they just basically closed because that was their largest selling thing. Um, you know, there's some in New York, San Francisco, um, pretty much all over. Every major city has some kind of some form of buyers club. Um, they're basically ways of just channeling in drugs that you can't get here that a lot of research has been done on that look effective and people want to get them. Now, um, are there places you can go? I mean, you know, is it like a certain one location and uh, yeah. you go and there's a whole shelf of things? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's their, their businesses, basically. Or it's run out of someone's house or something like that. Um, with the D what happened with DDC and uh, the history with the FDA is that F there's always been this fright or fear that the FDA is going to just really crack down. And people are just beginning to realize that if the FDA ever cracked down on the buyers clubs, that they would just have every AIDS activist in the country, you know, with a blowtorch at the <laughs> FDA. Um, basically, they're just keeping a hands-off approach. Um, the one change um, was with DDC that some people bought DDC from one of the buyers clubs, tested it, and released information that said that the DDC that they're selling isn't really DDC, or it is DDC, but in, in weird doses, that it wasn't, um, it wasn't standardized. And they, what happened is the FDA came in, a lot of the buyers clubs immediately just voluntarily pulled all the DDC from their shelves, except for the one in Fort Lauderdale, because they had, they were getting DDC from a different source. And they started putting in quality control mechanisms. So a lot of the buyers clubs now will test their own drugs, have it, they'll put it through laboratories, have it, have it tested to make sure that that it is actually quality drugs that they're putting out. So, uh, they're pretty much many pharmaceutical companies. Yeah, they have quality control. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Now, um, what is DHPG and when was it approved? Well, DHPG is Gencyclovir, which is used for CMV disease, or was originally meant for CMV retinitis. And um, there were a lot of problems with it because AZT was the only drug available as an antiretroviral, and gancyclovir has a lot of the same toxicities as AZT, so you, it was real difficult to use the same drugs together because it would just basically kill you with all the toxicities. But if you didn't have the gancyclovir, you probably would have, for people who had CMB retinitis, you would have gone blind. So there was this dilemma of, you know, how do we treat a person with CMB retinitis? We take them off AZT, do we give them gancyclovir? You know, what, what do you do? And Syntax, the, the drug, the pharmaceutical company, really didn't feel it ethical to do placebo-controlled trials because they just didn't want to see people going blind. You know, what do you do? Give them placebo, they go blind, give them the drug. You know, th they knew that the drug was effective. And the whole problem was the FDA wanted the placebo-controlled studies. And the drug company fought, the community fought, and and there were also, there was the fight between Burroughs Welcome and Syntax as to who really has the rights to the drug. So, I mean, it was just a big political nightmare. How do you get this drug approved? 
and finally in, I believe it was 89, it was finally approved. Wow. Just another case example of, of um, financial and political interest mm -hmm. involving a drug. Well, I mean, also, I mean, not only the, you know, the financial and political interest, but I think if it wasn't for a lot of the community, um, community pressure, it probably never would have happened. And so in, in that aspect, you have to really demonstrate that, you know, the AIDS community has accomplished a lot in regards to getting drugs out there, effective drugs to people. Um, now, what changes need to take place so that more drugs such as uh, DHPG uh, will be approved? Or is this current situation a good way to do it, just to have the AIDS community lobby, basically, to get drugs out there? Well, a lot of the researchers have come around. And we have a lot of researchers now very much value community input. And a lot of drug companies now very much value community input. I know Bristol Myers, um, and actually a lot of drug companies you know, meet regularly with people from the community, meet regularly with different agencies like us and Project Inform and GMHC. And they want to know what do you think, what do you think we should do? You know what. You know, what more can we be doing for the community to get more access to these drugs? Um, you know, we kind of, you know, push and prod them along. As, and if some, there's also a lot of problems sometimes with research between the researchers and the institutions like the NIH and the drug companies of, well, you know, I want to do this study, but this pharmaceutical company won't provide me with the drug, and this organization won't provide me with this and that. And so a lot of the times the community ends up being these liaisons between the drug companies and the researchers and the egos and the politicians and all these different things. And it's unfortunate it has to be that way, but if we can speed up the process, then, yeah. then we've done something. Right. And, you know, uh, there's, there's always this dilemma of, you know, why does AIDS get this special treatment? Why is it that, you know, all these AIDS drugs are getting approved and these cancer drugs aren't and this isn't happening with all these other, um, if you want to call it disease groups? And I guess the easiest thing to say is, well, we've aligned. We've created this community. We've, we've come together and fought for this. And other... If they got together, if they, they did the same thing, they can do it too. And we're seeing that happening with breast um, women for breast cancer. A lot of um, breast cancer activist groups are organizing around the issue, and they've really come to act up for a lot of help. Mm. They they're using our tactics. They're using um, they're going to act up meetings. They're having people from act up consult with them, literally, to help them design demonstrations, <laughs> design graphics, to, yeah. and ways of you know, tactics to pressure researchers and pressure companies into getting you things done. Take things in your own yeah. hands as well. Um, well, once the approval process takes place, I mean, exactly what happens and, and what kind of costs are involved in improving drugs? Any kind? Um, I mean, there's always the research and development costs that come into the picture, and that's always been a problem with some pharmaceutical companies because they won't they will say that this is how much it's cost us for research and development, but they won't share that with, they won't share the actual figures. They won't open up their books and say this is, this. we spent this much on this and this much on this. And that's been a big trouble right now with a drug company called Astra and a drug Foscarnet, which is used for CMV disease, very much like Yancyclovir, except it doesn't have the same toxicity, so you can use Foscarnet with AZT and with other different drugs. And the problem with Foscarnet is that they've char they're charging so much that it's basically either will ex it's I believe twenty four thousand dollars a year for this drug, um, and there are a lot of reasons. They have a lot of reasons why they say this drug costs so much. One of them being the research and development. Another one being that people will only be on this drug for a very short period of time, so we have to charge this much to recoup the cost of research and development, so we can further develop this drug and develop oral versions of the drug because it's an IV drug. I mean, I can go on hours as to why they claim right. they have to charge so much, and I can go on hours claiming, you know, counteracting every one of their arguments. So, I've completely lost track of what I was talking about. <laughs> um, well, uh, the, the track here is uh, that it, it does cost so much. Well, they claim that it costs so much. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, basically I was wondering, you know, how the approval process, once it is decided that a, a drug should be approved, um, what are the 
some of the processes that need to be taken before okay. it's released? Well, I mean, deciding on the cost is probably the one of the main issues. Um, that was the big problem that Burroughs Welcome had with AZT and that they kind of underestimated um, what the community reaction was going to be when they put the $10,000 a year price tag on it. Um, that quickly changed. And the drug companies will, the way they figure out their numbers is, is pretty twisted. They kind of figure in amount of life that is gained and if this person didn't have this drug and if as opposed to having the drug, you know, what's their productivity and um, I mean there are a lot of things that they look into, not only research and development. In fact, research and development is probably one of the least factors in creating and, and pricing a drug. In fact, in some in most instance, instances a lot of e economists and people who work for farm who people who used to work for pharmaceutical companies will say that that's not even an issue. Far research and development is a fixed number well, that... What would be the biggest cost? In what? Good question. Um, most... Uh, there's a lot of theories and no drug... A drug company will come out and say, we're charging this much because it costs us this much for research and development and we're trying to recoup our costs. And most economists and most people who work outside of the industry will say bullshit. They will say that they're charging that research and development again is fixed. That every drug company automatically includes that, and this is just something that they have to deal with. Research and development is just there. That it, it's not an issue with pricing a drug. Um, well, I it can't cost that much to actually produce it, though. I mean, can they? Really most drugs are very cheap, right. very cheap to produce, and some of the things they look at. Um, I mean, they, they look at how, what are the other drugs out there and they will compare it to its effectiveness. So with AZT um, and with DDI and DDC coming up, I mean, if AZT was still priced at that $10,000 mark and DDI came along, and if the price didn't go down, chances are DDI would be probably up there, right up there. at 10000 or just usually they'll come up a little bit below, you know, or, dep or depending on how effective it is, like Fuss Garnet because the research that came out demonstrated it to be a little bit more effective, depending on how you looked at the data, um, claimed to be more effective than gancyclovir. And it, and it claimed to be better um, for different reasons, meaning that the, it had different toxicities, so you were able to take it with AZT. There was actually one study that claimed that phosgarnet increased a person's survival time. And so there you are increasing someone's life, so, you know, boost, put a price, put a price on it. And so that's what they, that's, it seems like that's what they're doing. Well, how much is ACT per year? ACT per year is, it's really cheap now. It's probably around $1,200 a year. How about DDI and EDC? Um, each one respectively is about a little bit less. So they're up, but they're pretty much all around the same. And it depends where you're getting it from. Um, but the, the one thing with a lot of these drug companies is they all have patient assistance programs. So if you didn't have health insurance, if you weren't able to get it through some kind of federally subsidized program through your state or county or something like that, you would call them up. They put you through this financial aid type process. There's a way, there's a way, there's a way to get the drug. There's always a way. Okay. And the one problem with some of these drugs, such as Foscarnet, is that these drugs are available also on, and through some of these federally funded through Medicare, Medicaid, um, or some state aid drug programs. And the one thing we're seeing is that it can be one drug like this that can actually exhaust these federally funded systems that are eventually, you know, they, they do have limits <laughs> to the amount of things that they can afford. And, um, you know, Astra will pride itself in having their patient assistance program. But what most of these patient assistance programs do is they will hook you up with some kind of funding source first. And as a last resort, they will give you the drug free of charge. And granted, they have not let, some, not let anyone go without drug, but the whole process of, you know, finding some other source, you know, I'm they're, they're basically exhausting other things before they end up giving the drug free of charge. Right, right. A lot of uh, paperwork and... Oh, yeah. And, and in, in addition to that, with all the paperwork involved, um, it tends to be an obstacle with a lot of physicians' willingness to do it. Um, I know at one of the county clinics here, physicians will not use parallel track mechanisms, will not use compassionate use programs because there's so much paperwork involved, they don't have the time. 
they don't have the time to do the paperwork. They don't have the time or the t or the the willingness to actually with some of our pillow track programs like with D4T, there's a there's follow up that you have to go through, and some physicians may not be willing to go through that follow up processes, and so they won't they won't use patients in these programs. Um, what is AL721? <sighs> that one is. is, is, is is it legal or it's is not, it legal? it's not, it's never been approved. It's really one of those things that the community discovered, tried. Um, people tried making it. There are people making it in their kitchens, trying to sell it, make it, use it for themselves. And um, it's pretty there's a, it was, well, no one's, no one's even doing any, no one's doing anything with it anymore. Um, there was a lot of theory that it's, that because it's such a difficult thing to make that if you don't make it 100% exactly the way you're supposed to make it, that's not going to be effective. And so people were saying it wasn't effective because people didn't have the correct recipe or the correct method of making it. And you know, there were organizations that were pretty much slapping it together, trying to make it and sell it and give it out to I the community. I can imagine this can be a problem with all the drugs that aren't you know, being produced by a quote-unquote official drug company. Yeah, least. quality control. Exactly. That's, you know, the ha thing that happened with DGC. Right. But with this one, it's, I mean, it's literally Just eggs. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's egg fat that, oh, I see. Um, okay. that extracts, you know, the hard cholesterol from your cells, and it makes the cell much more fluid, which would make it less likely to, for HIV to attach to it. That's basically how it works. And... I mean, it's a very simple mechanism, but the way that you make, it, make right. it, yeah. And there was also a lot of controversy with, you know, the, the research that was in Israel, and you know, people were going to Israel in in stretchers and coming back, jumping off the plane. Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, if I went to Israel on a vacation for a month and I was that sick, I'd probably come back doing the same thing. So who's to say that it was these? the egg fat that the person was eating or whether or not just getting out of the country for a month and having a nice vacation didn't improve their health. <laughs> and there are people, s and there's still researchers that, and there's a treatment in um, who knows what country it's in now, but there was this, the big ROCA treatment that people were pushing and people were going to Switzerland, same thing, coming back, you know, feeling healthier than ever. Yeah. You know, yeah, I'd feel that way going to Switzerland too, but this, ba this guy was just, ba he was, there were, and there were some people that went there that claimed this is the most amazing thing. And realistically, most people came back saying, you know, why did I just spend $5,000? I don't feel any better. This is a joke. Wow. So, you know, you hear all these amazing stories. There's, and none of the research has ever been able to duplicate a lot of these things. Um, what are some of the basic problems which inhibit the approval of, of, of drugs like this? And uh, what are manufacturers doing to still get these drugs to their patients even though they are still not FDA approved. There are a lot of physicians that refer people to buyer's clubs that will um, let me think about it. Um, I mean, if they can get, well, a lot of physicians, if there's a way to get the drug, they'll, 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 they'll get it. They if, if they if it's if there's a way of getting it they can get it um, through uh, through buyers clubs through any any way I mean there's some drugs out there that the buyers clubs don't know about that people are doing and um, or are you know, doctors allowed to, to give you know patients drugs that haven't been approved doctors can't administer the drugs if a doctor administers the drug to somebody physically injects you with it then they can have their licenses revoked. But, um, I mean, referring someone to somewhere isn't illegal. I mean, they can say, hey, I know this person here, blah, blah, blah. Why don't you talk to him? Wink. I mean, they can always do that, but they can't physically inject you with something or hand you a pill and do it. Right. Do you think changes ought to be made so that doctors can get patients to these drugs more? Or do you, or do you see that? Basically, not really changing that much. And there's, I mean, there's a danger either way. I mean, there's a danger that people aren't going to get the drugs, and then there's the danger that there are a lot of quack physicians out there that don't know themselves that, or maybe pushing something that, if a, this person buys, 
they may have financial interests in that the patient doesn't know about. I mean, there's oh, and there's a lot of physicians, believe me, who have financial interests in drug companies and have financial interests in certain processes that have raked in money here in Los Angeles. I can name about four or five that I would just love to personally wring their necks. And I can honestly say have killed a lot of people to make some money. And so there's a lot of danger in that. Uh, so these are reputable LA doctors that, um, that have had financial interest in companies and they have um, basically their, their interests have been geared more toward the, the, uh, the stock and their the company. financial aspects of it, yeah. And there, are, uh, there are a lot of physicians who are making a lot of money on this disease. So it's not only the drug companies, it's not only the NIH, it's also a lot of the physicians themselves who are involved in making a lot of the money and involved in allowing people to die. Wow. It, it, you know, it seems <coughs> like it could be a, a, a way to regulate things, to get things on the table so that we could lower the cost and everybody could get their... Uh, um, get treated without all these, you know, agendas getting in the way. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's <laughs> hopefully things will change soon. Well, you would think that physicians going through medical school would want to go through it because they want to help people, but somewhere along the somewhere line, line they realize they can make a lot of money, and so that's what they, if that's how they choose it. Well, are there problems with, with malpractice in dealing with uh, alternative drugs? I mean, does that ever come up? Um, yeah. There was one physician in Los Angeles who... Um, did lose his license because he did administer um, a drug to people and it was later found out and went through court and it's no longer a physician has been done on that look effective and people want to get them. Um, um, are there places you can go? I mean, you know, is it like a certain one location and uh, yeah. you go and there's a whole shelf of things? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's their, their businesses basically or it's run out of someone's house or something like that. Um, with the D what happened with DDC and uh, the history with the FDA is that F there's always been this fright or fear that the FDA is going to just really crack down. And people are just beginning to realize that if the FDA ever cracked down on the buyers clubs that they would just have every AIDS activist in the country, you know, with a blowtorch at the <laughs> FDA. Um, basically, they're just keeping a hands-off approach. Um, the one change um, was with DDC that some people bought DDC from one of the buyers clubs, tested it, and released information that said that the DDC that they're selling isn't really DDC, or it is DDC, but in, in weird doses, that it wasn't, um, it wasn't standardized. And they, what happened is the FDA came in, a lot of the buyers clubs immediately just voluntarily pulled all the DDC from their shelves, except for the one in Fort Lauderdale. It, uh, it was one of those drugs that everybody thought, I mean, again, when a new drug comes out, there's always excitement, people thinking, oh, this is very promising, this is great. Um, and again, it was with one of those drugs, but then when some of the studies were done, again, there were a lot of problems with the studies, they didn't really see that much of an effect. And people that were using it, you were able to get it through the underground. And usually if, if there is an effect, you're going to, even if it's, just demonstrated to be nothing in a clinical study. If it's getting used in the community and if it's effective, word will get out that it's effective and people will, I mean, the buyers clubs will just get inundated with a lot so of, with not, a lot of the things and it never happened. Um, no, it's, it's not approved. Okay. Well, and, and the studies that were done just stopped and people, and the company in France, I believe that was making it, doesn't produce it anymore. Exactly, you know, what is it and how has the uh, FDA changed its approach to it? Mm -hmm. it's yeah, it's a real big change happened this year when DDC, before DDC was approved, peop, um, well, basically a little history of the, of the buyer's clubs. And they're, they're, all, they're all called different things. Some, most of them are just referred to generally as buyer's clubs. Um, the one in New York is PWA Health Group. There's some in Fort Lauderdale. There used to be one in Los Angeles, and once DDC was approved, they just basically closed because that was their largest selling thing. Um, 
You know, there's some in New York, San Francisco, um, pretty much all over. Every major city has some kind of some form of buyers club. Um, they're basically ways of just channeling in drugs that you can't get here. That a lot of research 